Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you all back. You see you got your coffee cups, and uh, we'll get right back into where we left off in the last program, which is in Romans chapter 5. But uh, first, we want to thank our television audience for all your cards and letters, as well as your contributions. My, it just thrills our heart. As I've said over and over over the years, our mail time is the best time of the day. And so again, from the depths of our heart, we, we just thank you for everything. All right, Iris just is motioning at me to remind you that uh, it's book 67 already. And uh, today's four programs and the next eight will all be in book 67. So that means it won't be ready yet for probably a couple months. But uh, Lord willing, and if he tarries, it will be coming. Okay, we're going to pick right up where we left off with what we're coming to, but we're sin abounds. But we're laying the groundwork for that this whole subject of sin that Paul is dealing with in these early chapters of Romans and what a cancer it has been on the whole human race. Sin, of course, is at the heart of all of humanity's problems. And uh, in our last program, we saw that sin wasn't really delineated until God gave it by virtue of the Ten Commandments. And that's where we left off then. So in verse 14... That's where we ended up. Nevertheless, death reigned like a king from Adam to Moses, absolutely, even though there was no specific written law. They had it in their conscience, remember. And so it reigned like a king from Adam to Moses, even over them who had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Now, all that says is the whole human race didn't eat of the forbidden tree. <laughs> That's obvious. That was merely the the step of disobedience that Adam took that plunged the whole human race and every form of sin followed. All right. But Adam's transgression was the figure or an example of him that was to come. Now Paul is introducing us to the whole biblical concept now, especially in Paul's epistles, that as sin came from one man, the remedy from sin comes from another man, the man Christ Jesus. All right, now this is what we're going to see in the succeeding verses. But, here's another but. This isn't the one I started with, but they're always flip sides. But not as the offense, not like eating of the forbidden tree, so also is the free gift. Now, in a way, they're, they're identical, and in a way, they're as separate as daylight and dark. Now, in the way that they are identical is that what one man did to plunge the human race into sin and death, one man did to overcome it. But on the other hand, we have to realize that even though Adam sent every human being into condemnation, Christ has accomplished everything that needs to be done, but only those who come in by faith will benefit from it. So it's not an automatic universalism, I guess is the word, that the whole human race has been saved through the work of the cross unless they believe it. All right, now let's just read on. Verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, much more, see, so that there is no excuse for a single human being to miss salvation. There is not any lack in what God has done to bring the whole human race to salvation. All right? So here we go again. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And it has abounded to many. In fact, let's just look at what it says in another portion. 2 Corinthians, honey. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because there are those who, who speak that the work of the cross was only for the believer. Well, that's not what my Bible says. And I don't like to just pick an argument with people. But I do have to point out where I disagree. 
No, the work of the cross wasn't limited to the believer. It accomplished everything that needed to be done for every last human being. See? All right, Rome, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Jump in at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, drives us, because we thus judge or conclude that if one died for how many? All, not just the few. That if one died for all, then we're all dead spiritually. Well, that's obvious. But he did die for every last human being. Now verse 15, he just repeats it. And that he died for all that they who live as a result of their faith should not henceforth live unto themselves because they're no longer under the old sin nature, but they'll live unto him who died for them and rose again. So here's the whole biblical concept that the work of the cross was sufficient for every human being that ever lived. None accepted. And then they come back and water it down and say it was only for those who became believers. All right, back to Romans chapter 5. Remember where we're heading. We're heading to that place where we get that profound statement that where sin abounds, God's grace does more abound. Well, we're not there yet. We're still building up to it. Now verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Now that sounds like double talk, but what Paul is saying that as one plunged the human race into death, one gave the offer of salvation as a free gift. And like I said a moment ago, in one respect they are alike, and on the other respect they're as different as daylight and dark. All right, now read on. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, Adam. When he sinned, the whole human race went down the tube with him. But, here's a flip side, the free gift is of many offenses or many sins, but it's going to lead to what? Justification. Totally acquitted. Made as if we had never sinned. That's what God does. All right, now then verse 17. For if by one man's offense, act of disobedience, when he ate the fruit, death reigned, and again I'm going to put it in, like a king, by one. Who's the one? Adam. Because of Adam's fall, the whole human race came under the subjection and the rule of sin and death. All right, reading on much more, see? So that there's no close call here. Much more they who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign again like a king, but not in death. Now what? Life, see? Now the believer can have life ruling and reigning by, like a king. And it was all brought about, how? By Jesus Christ. Now here we come, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, the fall of Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Every human being is going to an eternal doom unless they accept God's plan of salvation. All right? Even so, reading on in verse 18, even so by the righteousness of one, now we're talking about Christ, the free gift without merit, without cost, the free gift came upon how many? All men. None accepted. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life 
Now, I wasn't going to do this, but it's just coming to mind. And as you know now that when I feel the Spirit leads, we've got to go chase it down. Go back with me to John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1, and drop in at verse 9. where we're talking about John the Baptist first, but that he was merely the forerunner of Jesus the Christ, who we're talking about in verse 9. Not John the Baptist, but Christ. Got it? Verse 9. And Christ was that true light which lighteth some of the people. No. How many? Every. See? See? He was the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, beginning with Cain and Abel, and all the way down through him in history. Verse 10, he was in the world. And the world was made by him. He was the creator of it, but the world rejected him. All right, now let's go to another verse that Paul uses. Go all the way back to Titus. We've done this before, but I think it's quite a while ago. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. Now, this, of course, is Paul writing from his period of time in the 50 A.D., somewhere there around, 50 to 60. Y'all got it? Verse 11. For the grace of God, this message that Christ had now paid the sin debt for every human being, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has, well, I'll have to correct that. He wrote this probably after 60 A.D., even though his ministry went from 40 on up to 67, 68, somewhere in there. But anyway... What does it say? The grace of God that bringeth salvation has, past tense, appeared unto how many? All men. Now, I can't tell you how that happened. I cannot even begin, no more than I can John 1, 9. How can I explain that Christ, as the light of the world, appeared to every human being, some way or another, I can't explain it, but that's what the book says. And Paul comes back now and says basically the same thing, that this saving grace has already appeared unto all men. Well, if it had appeared in Paul's day, then I have to sit here and say, it includes us today. There is not a human being slipping out into eternity, even today, who will have an excuse, which brings up the next verse, doesn't it? Romans. Back to Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. Now, these are thought-provoking concepts. I know they are. And I certainly do not have all the answers. All I can show is what the book says. Romans, chapter 1, verse 20. And this, again, goes back to what we saw in Romans 5 that from Adam to Moses, even though they didn't have the Mosaic law, they were responsible. God had given them conscience, see? All right, now look what Romans 1.20 says. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, that is from Adam, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made or the things of creation, even his eternal power and Godhead, who he is, so that what? They are without excuse. In other words, lost people are going to come up before the great white throne and they will not have one word of excuse. They're going to stand there condemned and guilty and with a closed mouth because they know they're guilty. 
they aren't going to be able, yeah, I guess the Lord did say, and they'll say in that day, but didn't we do this and didn't we do that? But basically, they won't have a word to say because God had offered salvation as a free gift to the whole human race, none accepted. Now, I wish I could explain how that all comes about, but I can't. But uh, God is sovereign. He's in total control, and we have to take on the basis of his word. All right, back again to Romans chapter 5, if you will. Verse 18 again. I don't think we can repeat this too much because even the scripture itself keeps repeating and repeating. Well, there's a purpose. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam's fall, came condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the work of the cross, the power of his resurrection, the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. In other words, like I've already said, total acquittal. Now verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many or all were made sinners, so now the flip side is by the obedience of of one. Now, don't miss the language. The disobedience of Adam is more than compensated for by the obedience of Christ. Many shall be made righteous. Not all, but many. Now, verse 20. We're getting close to my beginning. Moreover, the law entered. Now, like we said in the first half hour today, 2,500 years after Adam, the law comes in. The Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. Moreover, the law entered that the offense or that sin might abound. Well, not that the law made people sin more, but the law made the human race aware of what's right and wrong. Now, I think I made the comment in our last taping several weeks ago when I didn't have a voice. You remember that, don't you? And how did I put it? Our kids today do not know the difference between right and wrong. I had a letter from some teenagers, clear up in Washington State, and that was the dilemma. Their friends did not see anything wrong with things that are biblically wrong. And they were church people. So what's the problem? They're ignorant of the Word of God. They are ignorant of what's right and wrong. And all the way to the top of our corporations. Why all the corruption in high places? They don't really see there's that much wrong with it anymore. If you can get away with it, power to you. Buy another yacht, that's all. But listen, the law entered to show the human race what is right and what's wrong. And I think I made the comment on a program years ago that if the human race could keep the Ten Commandments, we could send all our lawyers home, we could close the courtrooms, there would be no law-breaking whatsoever. Why? Because the Ten Commandments so completely cover every facet of the human experience. You know that? There is nothing in the human experience that those Ten Commandments don't deal with. But see, we've shut them out. And consequently, there is no conscience of right and wrong. But that was the purpose of them. All right. So that's why the law came, to show men what's right and wrong. Now then, reading on, here we come. But, but, in spite of the horrific slide of the human race down into gross sin, immorality, corruption, theft, and murder, and the law condemned every bit of it, but it's not hopeless. It's not hopeless. Why? Because where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Now, do you know what that means? There is not a sinner on this world so vile, but that if he will come in simple faith believing, God's grace is sufficient to save. 
Now, I debated as I laid awake a little bit last night whether I should use this or not, but I think I'm safe because I think all of us are aware there is one name in human history that stands above every other name at the epitome of evil and wickedness. Who is it? Hitler. Hitler. He was the epitome of wickedness and of sinfulness. But, now here's my point. Had that man in his bunker, as everything was falling in around him, had that man in contrite faith come to accept God's offer of salvation, would God have saved him? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what this verse is showing. That we're sin abounded, even in the life of a man like Adolf Hitler. God's grace would have been sufficient to save him. Now that should stick with you for a while, shouldn't it? And so we look at humanity today and we think, oh, there's no hope. Yes, there is. There's hope for the vilest sinner. We've had some in our ministry. I don't even like to share them on the, on the program. But oh, how they'll come out of the dregs of sin and become a useful citizen. And that's what God's saving grace can do. All right, so reading on now. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Why? Because, you see, Christ's work of the cross is so much more powerful than the condemnation laid on Adam that no matter how far someone goes, into the Adamic curse or into the Adamic life of sin, God's work of redemption is still greater. Now then, for you and I who have not gone to the depths of that and we have been saved by God's grace, is there any reason for us to doubt? Absolutely none, because if God can save the worst of sinners, then it's a settled fact he saved us who didn't go that deep. And so always remember that where sin abounds, the grace of God is always greater. All right, now verse 21. That as sin, that old Adamic force to go disobedient to the things of God, that as sin has reigned like a king, unto death, physical as well as spiritual, even so my grace reign as king through the righteousness unto eternal life. But there's only one way, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the only answer to the mankind's dilemma, is to put faith in that finished work of the cross. And I, I can't comprehend why people who oppose my line of teaching, I can't understand it. I suppose the next guy thinks the same thing of what he's teaching. But when I make it so simple that when Christ finished the work of the cross, everything that God could demand of a human being was consummated there, and all we have to do is take it as a free gift. Now, why do people rebel at that? And they do. Oh, they don't like it. And I can't comprehend it. Now, if I was way out there with some kooky, now you got to do this and you got to, then I could say, well, yeah, they, they can't come. In. But I'm just laying it out here so simple that as Christ offered salvation as a free gift because of that death, burial, and resurrection, why do they hate it so? I can't comprehend it. Oh, I just can't help saying it over and over. All right, but now we've got to come a little further on this, that when the grace of God is abounding on the human race in spite of their sin, now Paul asks a logical question in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in or shall we continue to practice sin so that we can capitalize on grace? And what's his answer? God forbid, banish the thought. Don't even think such a thing that the grace of God, and you've heard me say it on the program over all the years, grace is not license. Grace is not license. 
Grace doesn't say, well, don't worry about it. Go ahead and do what you want to do because God's grace is going to be greater. No, that's not what we mean. We mean that when it comes to that point of salvation, yes, God's grace is greater than anyone's sin. But when we're brought up out of that cesspool and sin, God does not expect us to continue a life of sin with the excuse, well, His grace will bring me out of it again and again and again. No, that's not the teaching of Scripture. All right, so when we come out of that cesspool, now then, verse 2, reading on, how shall we that are dead to that old Adamic nature, how shall we who are dead to that life of sin live any longer therein? Well, that's a logical question, isn't it? If you've once come out of a horrendous background, should there be any desire to go back to it periodically? Heavens no. That should be something totally behind us, see? Now then, I think we can, we can almost, well, I'm not going to. We're too close to the end. All right, jump on over to, in, still in chapter 6. Let's go to verse 5. Let's jump over to verse 5 because my next one is going to be down in uh, verse 17 for the next program. But for now, to finish this minute that's left, let's just continue on. As the person who has been saved out of a cesspool of sin where God's grace abounded, now then Paul is explaining how it all took place. For if we have been planted, in other words, in the likeness of his death and his burial and his resurrection, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, then we as believers shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay, now i got time, I think, for one more verse, honey. Find it quickly. Philippians. And then it's going to be over. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 3. And drop down quickly to verse 20 and 21. And this all becomes a reality now because of our believing the gospel. You got it? Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven... From whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, now here it comes, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.